So one day after I had first moved back to Illinois and started as a professor, so this would be, oh, probably 1986, I was looking out the window to the south and I saw this giant fireball in the sky. Now we live out way in the countryside. There aren't any houses maybe for a mile around. And thinking that, oh my gosh, some neighbor a few miles away, their barn's on fire. I've got to go help. I'm not exactly sure what I would do if I got there and their barn's on fire, but still, and maybe because you're trying to work on some lecture or some naughty research problem, you like any excuse to get in the car at around one in the morning, I got in the car, started heading south towards the fireball in the sky. And I'm going and I notice, ooh, this is a little further than I thought, that's a really big fireball. Get a little bit further, it's clearly not a barn on fire. It looks like it's a large chemical company, almost like a refinery. I didn't know much about the area at that time. I'd only lived there a couple years. Hadn't really gone off that direction. But I got closer and closer, and the plant is not on fire. There's no disaster. There's no screaming sirens. But there is a very large chimney, and out of it is coming a very large fireball. So I figure, hmm, I wonder what this is. And I really haven't seen this before. You would think that this is something that's normal. I would probably have seen it all the time late at night. So I drive to the gate, to the guard at the gate. The plant says quantum chemical. Tuscola, Illinois. And, and I asked the guard. Well, that's a little bit crazy. Some, uh, some random 20-year-old guy or late 20s guy comes to your plant in the middle of the night. Uh, and then I, of course, probably made it even weirder by saying, oh, I'm an engineering professor. Um, he said, oh, gosh, he's never going to leave. Right. But he starts uh, talking to me. I say, hey, well, well, what's, uh, what's up? He said, oh, yeah, line number two is down. Oh yeah, that explained everything. All right, so after a few more questions and then after going back and doing a little more research, you see, natural gas is not just methane. If I take the whole lane line of hydrocarbons, right? One carbon is methane, CH4. Two carbons is ethane. Three is propane. Four is butane. All of these things are gaseous hydrocarbons. And then there's even ones that are gaseous that have cyclic hydrocarbons, ones where the carbons are in circles. So when you take natural gas, it's something like 99% methane, but these other impurities are with it. And those other impurities are both valuable to use, feedstocks for the chemical industry, but also something that if you ran them day after day in your furnace, or you ran them day after day in your natural gas power plant, or day after day in all the other places that you would use natural gas, maybe on your stove. You could eventually clog up the burners, you'd have carbons that wouldn't fully combust. So someone's job is to take this out of the natural gas. So the stuff that's delivered to your home through the convenient pipeline system is just methane. Quantum Chemical is one such company. They have to remove the impurities from the natural gas and then deliver onto the line just methane. Typically, they take all these other things, liquefy them, do something with them in some manner, utilize them, and then sell them, even to nearby companies that use those chemical feedstock inputs. But if something's wrong in the plant, and they can't turn it into these useful fuels, they still have to take it out of the methane, the natural gas that's going through the plant. So because that line was down, the one that was actually making the chemical feedstocks out of these impurities, they had no choice but to just burn them off. Hence the fireball in the sky. And also why I hadn't seen it before, because normally the plant works just fine. So let's think about what happens to that natural gas next. You'd think it would just go right into the pipelines and be the heating source for everyone's house. Now let's think about that a little bit more. When do you need to heat the metropolitan area of Chicago? In the winter, not in the summer, 
even though people have natural gas coming to their homes in the summer, their gas bills are tiny. Yet, somehow, the gas has to all be there when you're in the middle of the winter and it's a cold, frigid temperature and the wind is howling and your furnace is working constantly to try to keep your house warm. You can't possibly have a big enough pipe to just meet demand at those peak times and then just have it sit there with nobody using the gas for half of the year. So what they do is they store it. They pump all summer, all fall, maybe the last part of the spring, and they put it into storage so that when a metropolitan area of the size of Chicago needs gas in the winter, they can pull it out of storage and they have it. Well, the storage you might think of as some big giant tank above ground. And then you have to do the math. How big would that tank need to be to fuel the homes where seven million people live? Pretty darn big. There has to be another way to store it. So let's go back to another story I told you about. When they were exploring for oil near my home, and I did not decide to sell the mineral rights of my land. Well, that oil well turned out to be a dry one. Yes, the trucks did detect a permeable rock layer of the right density at the correct depth. There could have been oil there, but it turned out when they drilled the holes to try to find the oil, there was none. And there was no gas either. But there was this permeable rock layer around a mile deep under a vast area of that part of Champaign County. What are you going to use it for? Well, you probably guessed it. That's where you put the natural gas. That is the storage tank. You might say, seriously? You take all that gas you're taking from the Gulf of Mexico or from these days from North Dakota that's coming in on pipelines and you just shove it underground? Yeah, the volume you need is something like that. And you're pushing it into rock. You're pushing it into this porous rock I showed you earlier. It, it's tiny little holes and fissures in the rock, but you can pump and push the gas down into that area. And then when you need it, you can pump it back out. Do you lose some? Absolutely. But it's really the only possible way you can do this because to build an above ground storage container big enough to hold that much gas would be impossible and dangerous. Can you imagine? Oh, I've got 10 acres covered with a giant building all filled with pressurized natural gas. I bet nothing can go wrong there. Natural gas is stripped of its heavier hydrocarbons, taken as methane, and pressurized in underground rock formations until it's needed to use as an energy source. Methane itself has no smell. But whenever somebody has a gas leak, right, or the stove has been left on without the burner on, you can smell that gas all over the house. That's intentional. There is a small amount of an extremely smelly compound put into all natural gas for that exact reason so that you can detect if there's a leak. So now that we know a little bit more about natural gas, let's examine where it is in the world. So here's a chart of the countries with proven reserves. Now, I've always thought these proven reserve numbers are a little bit hinky because each year they don't change very much. But that's because you have to recognize that a reserve is available, but it doesn't say at what price. We believe, or whoever creates these numbers and studies them and somewhere else that creates the numbers and then argues about the numbers, we believe that this is recoverable gas. Just like with oil numbers, at a certain price, you probably can recover even more or maybe find even more reserves because you'll have incentive to do it. If the prices go down, you may not bother. We will never run out of oil or natural gas 
what will happen is it will just get too expensive to be used. I used to think $100 a barrel for oil was pretty expensive, but what that did was it allowed us to economically explore for other oil sources. Tar sands, for instance, or fracking to get tight oil or tight gas out of shale formations. If the price is high enough, the research, the investment, the capital expenditures, and the techniques, and then infrastructure are built to be able to get a resource that can still be sold at that price. So we look at these reserves and we see the number one country in the world is Russia. Russia has vast reserves of natural gas and may even have more if you develop the stuff in the permafrost in deep Siberia. That would be one of those cases where the price of gas would have to go up pretty darn high. The infrastructure to get to those parts of the world, a frozen swamp without much present infrastructure, would be very high. And ways to actually get that type of methane out safely in large quantities would also have to be developed. But even just from standard gas wells, Russia has a rich reserve. Since natural gas and oil are formed through the same biologic process, they're both formed in marine environments, it's not surprising that other countries on this list are the same countries that have oil. Iran, in particular, is number two. The other Gulf states, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, all have reserves of natural gas. Iraq, Kuwait as well. Now, you can look at some other countries on this list, like the United States. The number of proven reserves in the United States has been steadily going up as we have found the economic manner in which to extract it from shale.